Uh, good afternoon or, or good morning, uh, depending on uh, which time zone you may be viewing us from. Uh, my name is John Iskander. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this month's uh, Public Health uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, coming to you from the CDC, uh, just wanted to clarify exactly which CDC it's coming from. Uh, so the one on the right is the real CDC, where we're broadcasting from in Atlanta. The one on the left plays the CDC in the TV series, The Walking Dead. J just wanted to clear that up for you. Uh, the next question many of you may have on your minds is, where is Dr. Popovich? I can assure you that she's still very much engaged in Grand Rounds, but as these pictures indicate, she has been a little bit busy with other tasks as well. Um, we want to remind all of our viewers that Grand Rounds is available for continuing education credits or contact hours for um, seven different professional categories. Uh, the information uh, on this slide uh, gives details and uh, those of you seeking uh, continuing education can uh, consult the website for more information. Uh, we're pleased again to partner with the um, CDC Library and Information Center uh, to feature uh, peer-reviewed articles relevant to uh, multidrug resistant gonorrhea. Uh, uh, Dr. Kirkaldi has uh, selected a very impressive group of articles for us. Uh, particularly for those of you with an interest in the um, international aspects of this. Uh, this is a selection of them. You can look on the Science Clips uh, CDC website for uh, even more information. Um, so again, we have uh, uh, all in the family uh, with Grand Rounds. We have featured articles uh, periodically in the MMWR. We have our Science Clips feature once a month. And we have uh, our Grand Rounds website, which is our source for um, all things Grand Rounds, uh, archives, uh, YouTube, um, a lot of relevant links there. Uh, Grand Rounds is not going to be taking a summer vacation. Uh, over the next three months, uh, we'll be with you every month uh, with a very uh, important group of sessions spanning chronic disease prevention and control on the global level, uh, a very uh, important session next month on an important injury prevention topic, and then um, looking at high-impact HIV uh, prevention, a, a winnable battle in August. And again, uh, all things Grand Rounds on, on the website. I just wanted to take a quick moment to recognize just a few of the many people uh, who uh, support and, and make Grand Rounds possible every month. Um, again, this is just a, a small fraction of the folks. I don't like the term behind the scenes because they are visible to me uh, all the time with, the, with their work. Just wanted to recognize them for a little bit. Um, so Grand Rounds is working on its own social media present. You'll hear more about that in the future. Uh, Grand Rounds has hit the blogosphere. Uh, Marin McKenna, who's a former uh, correspondent for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, plugged Grand Rounds uh, on her uh, blog, which I believe is called Superbug, uh, about uh, 10 days ago. Um, so before we turn to our speakers who have put together a, a really uh, fascinating and engaging and frankly uh, frightening uh, set of uh, presentations for you all today, uh, we're going to have some uh, prepared marks from Dr. Frieden. Today's Public Health Grand Rounds is about gonorrhea, a sexually transmitted infection that's the second most commonly reported infection in the U.S., even though we estimate that only about half of all infections are reported and many are asymptomatic and only detectable by screening. Untreated or inadequately treated gonorrhea can lead to severe complications, including pelvic inflammatory disease, ectopic pregnancy, and infertility. Untreated gonorrhea also increases the risk for the spread of HIV. In 2010, the rate of gonorrhea among African Americans was nearly 20 times higher than the rate among whites, and unfortunately, this disparity has not changed in recent years. 
poverty, unemployment, educational opportunities, access to health care, all contribute to this disparity. Gonorrhea is treatable with antibiotics, but treatment has been complicated by increasing resistance to antibiotics, starting with resistance to the sulfonamides in the 1940s, to penicillin in the 1970s and 80s, to tetracycline in the 1980s, and to fluoroquinolones by 2007. Our remaining treatment option is a cephalosporin antibiotic, and unfortunately, cephalosporin resistance is spreading. There are no other currently recommended antimicrobials, and the challenge as we move forward is detecting gonococcal resistance as we reduce laboratory culture capacity with the increasing use of nucleic acid amplification tests. Lack of culture capacity can also limit surveillance for resistance and hinder the detection of treatment failures. This session will discuss the threat of gonococcal antimicrobial resistance, the central role of surveillance, the molecular foundations of resistance, and the prospects for development of new antimicrobial agents. We'll also outline the important steps that public health, clinicians, laboratorians, and at-risk people can take to prevent and respond. Thank you. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Edward Hook. Thank you and good day. Um, as I start, I uh, have some disclosures as part of continuing education requirements. I'm disclosing this information about the research support that I uh, receive. To outline what my initial comments will be, um, I'm going to start by uh, putting the gonococcal epidemic in, in uh, context. Gonococcal infections are the second most commonly imported infectious disease in the United States and a global health problem. Antibiotic therapy for gonococcal infections has evolved since the introduction of modern antimicrobial therapy. Surveillance for antibiotic-resistant gonococci now allows changes to treatment recommendations before treatment failures can become a major problem. And finally, I will review current treatment recommendations and how the growing threat of cephalosporin-resistant gonococci could end easily administered, reliable, single-dose treatment for this infection. At present, over 300,000 cases of gonorrhea are reported annually to the CDC. However, this represents uh, at least a 50% underestimate due to empiric treatment and underreporting. Many think of gonorrhea as an infection primarily characterized by an uncomfortable inflammatory genital discharge. This misperception, however, underestimates the true morbidity associated with this very common infection. Undiagnosed and untreated gonorrhea causes life-altering complications, which disproportionately impact women. The most common and impactful complication of gonorrhea is pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID, which leads to infertility in over 10% of cases. Gonorrhea contributes substantially to the burden of PID. PID also accounts for an estimated 50% of ectopic pregnancies in women worldwide and causes chronic lower abdominal pain in 10 to 15% of infected women. Other important complications include disseminated gonococcal infection and blindness in children born to infected mothers. The presence of untreated gonorrhea also increases the risk for either HIV transmission or acquisition by three to five-fold. Rates of gonorrhea in the United States declined starting in the 1940s as penicillin became widely available. However, for a variety of reasons, beginning in the 1960s, rates then increased dramatically. In 1976, gonorrhea peaked at over 1.1 million cases per year and then declined as changes that I mentioned above began to shift and then later accelerated with behavioral changes related to the HIV epidemic. Unfortunately, for the past seven years, gonorrhea rates have plateaued leaving us vulnerable to resurgence of infection, particularly if the organism becomes resistant to recommended therapy. While gonorrhea is reported regularly from across the nation, it is relatively more common in certain areas, including the southeastern United States, 
parts of the West Coast, and Alaska. Gonorrhea also provides another example of health disparities which occur with all STDs. In 2010, U.S. gonorrhea rates were more than 18 times higher in blacks than whites, a disparity that has changed relatively little over the past decade. Gonorrhea has also been recognized since biblical times, and efforts to treat gonorrhea have been sought for centuries. In the 1800s, patent medicines were used for therapy. In fact, some of our patients still ingest similar things since Dr. Reed's Eureka tonic was a dilute solution of cocaine and alcohol. Early in the 20th century, medical treatment emphasized irrigation of the genital tracts with caustic solutions such as potassium permanganate, mercurochrome, and other antiseptics. Some would say that this was the origin of the concept of punitive therapy for STDs. In 1937, modern antimicrobial therapy began with the increasing availability of sulfonilamide. But by 1944, over one-third of gonorrhea patients treated with maximal doses of sulfa were failing therapy. Fortunately, in 1943, penicillin had come along and became the drug of choice for gonorrhea therapy over nearly 50 years. During the same time, that, uh, during this same time, gonococci progressively became more resistant to penicillin, leading ultimately to an over 60-fold increase in the amount of penicillin required to reliably cure the infection. In addition, over this period, pharmacologic tricks, such as the addition of probenicid to raise and prolong penicillin blood levels were required to address continued emergence of gonococcal penicillin resistance. While penicillin was the drug of choice during this period, other classes of antimicrobials were also proven to be effective and were used for gonorrhea therapy. None of these drugs is any longer first-line therapy for gonorrhea treatment. In 1987, in order to monitor development of gonococcal resistance and to allow for anticipatory changes to treatment recommendations, the CDC created a Sentinel surveillance project the Gonococcal Isolate Surveillance Project, or GISP. Using specimens submitted to reference laboratories for men with gonorrhea seen in STD clinics across the nation, GISP has been used to follow trends in gonococcal antimicrobial resistance, allowing for treatment recommendations to be changed before treatment failures became a major public health problem. This slide shows the current sites from which GIST specimens are collected as seen in the blue dots, as well as the five current reference laboratories in Birmingham, Atlanta, Cleveland, Seattle, and Austin. I'll now move on to describe how the gonococcus has progressively developed resistance to fluoroquinolones, such as ciprofloxacin, and how our GIST surveillance helped lead to changes in the CDC's national recommendations for treatment. This may be the same sort of process now occurring with cephalosporin antibiotics. In the 2006 STD treatment guidelines, fluoroquinolone antibiotics, along with the cephalosporins, were recommended as the mainstay of treatment for persons with uncomplicated gonorrhea. These guidelines recommended that either the fluoroquinolones or cephalosporins uh, be used as single-dose therapy for gonorrhea. Because chlamydia was often simultaneously present in persons with gonorrhea, it was also recommended that therapy for chlamydia using either azithromycin or doxycycline be given to all persons for whom coexistent chlamydial infection had not been ruled out. At the time that the 2006 STD treatment guidelines were published, GISP surveillance had begun to show increasing resistance to fluoroquinolone antibiotics. Because resistance is a stepwise process, lower or so-called intermediate levels of resistance tended to occur before and to predict development of higher levels of resistance, which were beginning to be associated with the increased likelihood of treatment failures. 
The GIST data also showed that while resistance was an increasing problem across the nation, it appeared to have begun first in the western United States, having been first noted to be increasing in Hawaii and California GIST sites. Similarly, not all persons with gonorrhea were equally likely to have ciprofloxacin resistant gonococci. Gonococci diagnosed in men who had sex with other men were more likely to display ciprofloxacin resistance. By 2007, it was clear the fluoroquinolones could no longer be recommended for reliable single dose therapy for gonorrhea. Thus, by the time of the 2010 STD treatment guidelines, recommended treatment was only cephalosporins, either 250 milligrams of ceftriaxone or 400 milligrams of cefixine. In addition, a second, more subtle change had been made. Azithromycin or doxycycline cotherapy was now recommended for all patients with uncomplicated gonorrhea, reasoning that the second antibiotic might not only treat co coexistent chlamydial infection, but could also have an additive effect in killing the gonococcus since many gonococci were susceptible to these antibiotics. With only cephalosporin antibiotics recommended as the backbone for gonorrhea therapy, a new threat appears to be emerging. In this slide, the term MIC refers to the concentration of an antimicrobial required to kill gonococci. In recent years, we've seen a gradual decrease in the susceptibility of the gonococcus to cephalosporins. Suffixing treatment failures and decreasing susceptibilities are now reported not only in the United States, but also in Asia, Europe, and Canada. As was seen in the past, increasing resistance to suffixine was detected first in the western U.S. and among men who have sex with other men. Thus, in summary, there is clear agreement that emerging gonococcal resistance to cephalosporins is a major global threat that could take us back more than 60 years to a time when treatments used for gonorrhea were not reliably effective and when there were no alternative therapies. One possible next step could be the recommendation that cefixine, which can be administered by mouth, no longer be used for treatment of gonorrhea, and that whenever possible, only ceftriaxone be used, as well as that all persons treated for gonorrhea continue to be treated with two drugs. Even so, given the gonococcus's proven ability to progressively develop resistance, such measures would likely only be temporizing and do not reduce the pressing need for new antibiotics for treatment of this important pathogen. So with that, I will now introduce Dr. William Schaefer from Emory University and the Atlanta VA Medical Center. Good afternoon. My name is William Schaefer, and today I will discuss the molecular basis of antimicrobial resistance expressed by Neisseria gonorrhea, also known as the gonococcus. I will focus on three main issues. The genetics of antimicrobial resistance expressed by the gonococcus, the importance of culture-based antimicrobial testing, and the potential for using molecular assays to detect antimicrobial resistance markers. When discussing the genetic basis of antimicrobial resistance to the gonococcus, it is important to remember that spontaneous mutations can occur rapidly in the gonococcus. Resistance results from mutations that occur spontaneously and by acquisition of new genes from other bacteria. Resistance is further promoted by antimicrobial selection pressure, which occurs when antimicrobial drugs kill susceptible strains but allow resistant strains to survive. Resistance genes can also then spread to other strains of the gonococcus. Understanding the mechanisms developed by the gonococcus to resist penicillin and cerpofloxacin is important for two reasons. Despite the discontinuation of their use in the clinical treatment of gonorrhea, the resistance genes persist in current strains. Some of the same systems that are making the gonococcus less susceptible to ceftriaxone and cefixime, uh, which are the main antimicrobials used today to cure gonorrhea. P 
Penicillin was introduced in the United States in the 1940s to treat gonorrhea. There are two systems in the gonococcus that result in resistance to penicillin. The first is low-level resistance characterized by multiple mutations that reduce penicillin entry into the bacterial cell, increase penicillin efflux, and reduce the, the ability of penicillin to bind to and inhibit enzymes called penicillin binding proteins 1 and 2, which are responsible for synthesizing the cell wall. This resistance phenotype, though low, is nevertheless clinically relevant. In 1976, the gonococcus developed high-level resistance to penicillin by acquiring a gene that encodes beta-lactamase, which is an enzyme that destroys penicillin. In 1987, the prevalence of penicillin resistance was so high that treatment of gonorrhea with penicillin was discontinued. Ciprofloxacin kills bacteria by inhibiting their ability to maintain important structures of DNA. It binds to and inhibits enzymes involved in forming these structures. The genes encoding these enzymes are called GYR-A and PAR-C. By the early 1990s, susceptibility to ciprofloxacin decreased and resistance rapidly developed. Resistance occurred in two steps. First, there was a mutation in GYR-A that resulted in intermediate resistance. Then a mutation in PAR-C resulted in high-level resistance. And so by 2007, ciprofloxacin was no longer recommended for treatment of gonorrhea. In the 1980s, cephalosporins were found to be active against the gonococcus and were more active than penicillin. They are also resistant to the enzyme that destroys penicillin. But in, two, in 2007, the cephalosporins became the antimicrobial of choice for treating gonorrhea. But by 2009, strains were found to be less susceptible to cephalosporins, and they had acquired a new PEN-A gene that encodes a penicillin binding protein 2 that has a low affinity for penicillin and cephalosporins. They also overproduce an efflux pump that exports uh, penicillin and an important cephalosporin, ceftriaxone. The MTRCD efflux pump that I just mentioned is of importance because it can remove toxic hydrophobic substances and it is needed for sustained lower genital tract infection in mice. The action of the pump confers protection against host innate immunity systems that consist of antimicrobial peptides and other compounds such as progesterone. Thus mutations that increase pump gene expression can decrease gonococcal susceptibility to penicillin, cephalosporins, and host defenses such as antimicrobial peptides. Overproduction of the pump can be due to mutations in a gene that encodes a repressor of the genes encoding the pump, resulting in intermediate resistance to, antimicrobial res uh, to antimicrobials, which is probably not clinically relevant. However, a single nucleotide change near the promoter for the pump genes results in high-level le expression of the pump and high-level resistance to antimicrobials. This single nucleotide change has been seen in strains expressing decreased susceptibility to ceftriaxone. It was important for us to find out why resistance mutations persist in the gonococcus, even when certain antibiotics are no longer used. We wanted to test the hypothesis that the mutation provides a fitness advantage, even without selection pressure. By fitness, we mean the ability of the resistant mutant to survive compared to the susceptible parent strain. Specifically, we conducted experiments with uh, infected female mice to study survival and fitness of gonococci that overexpress the pump or are resistant to ciprofloxacin. We found that mutations that result in overexpression of the efflux pump can increase the fitness of the gonococcus by 100 to 1,000 fold. Interestingly, mutation in gyre A alone increases fitness by 50 fold. A second mutation in PAR C decreases fitness by two fold. But if, but if the ciprofloxacin resistant mutant also overproduces the pump, fitness can be increased by 50 fold. Since mutations conferring resistance, can increase fitness and survival in the absence of antimicrobial selective pressure, 
Our results suggest that mutations can persist and that previously recommended antimicrobials may not be reintroduced for routine use. Antimicrobial susceptibility testing is essential for detecting and monitoring antimicrobial resistance in gonococci. It requires culturing, which can be difficult because the bacteria can be fragile and difficult to grow. Culture is critical for detection and monitoring resistance. Thus, if a patient fails cephalosporin therapy, culture should be done and antimicrobial susceptibility testing performed. Unfortunately, culture is not routinely performed in clinical settings, and many laboratories have shifted to the use of molecular testing methods. The percentage of tests for gonorrhea that were culture-based has declined from 18% in 2000 to only 5% as of 2007, and many laboratories no longer have the capacity to culture the gonococcus. While molecular tests can detect the gonococcus, they do not provide information regarding resistance. Molecular tests for known resistance mutations are not yet available, but are currently being developed. In summary, the gonococcus is an intriguing organism that mutates rapidly. Mutations that cause resistance can develop quickly, spread among strains, and persist even when the antibiotic is no longer used. As culturing declines, we are less able to detect resistance in clinical isolates. This significantly impacts our ability to respond, which can result in clinical treatment failures. There is an urgent need to develop rapid, sensitive, and reliable molecular diagnostics to help in the surveillance for resistant gonococci. Still, it is unlikely that such tests will completely replace culture-based susceptibility testing. I would now like to introduce Dr. Carolyn Deal from the National Institutes of Health. Good afternoon. My name is Carolyn Deal. I'm from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH. I want to remind you that there are various ways that bacteria require, acquire resistance. Selective pressure that results in resistance to antimicrobials can come from a variety of practices. Of importance to the gonococci are overprescribing, patients not taking the entire prescription, and over-the-counter availability in some parts of the world. The problem, however, is not unique to the gonococci. Antimicrobial resistance has been identified across a wide spectrum of pathogens. This is a representative list of pathogens with a high clinical burden where resistance threatens effective treatment. This problem is important not only in the United States, but worldwide. This is recognized as such an important problem that NIAID has developed an entire research agenda for antimicrobial resistance. I will focus on those, those aspects of biomedical research that apply to the gonococci. This figure illustrates a variety of different types of research. Some of the types of basic research are indicated with blue arrows on the top part of the slide. Data from these studies inform the development of the translational and clinical types of research indicated with red arrows on the bottom of the slide. A goal of NIAID is to maintain a comprehensive and sustainable research agenda. Currently, NIH supports approximately 137 grants on gonorrhea. Basic research looks at understanding the mechanisms of pathogenesis, how the bacteria evades the immune response, and what human immune response would be protective against gonococcal infection. Translational research focuses on the development of potential vaccine candidates, new generation diagnostics, and new antimicrobials. Vaccines and microbicides are prevention strategies while antimicrobials are used for treatment. Some of the promising vaccine candidates being studied target cell service components in lipooligosaccharides. Research into diagnostics is investigating the use of markers specific for the gonococci and other approaches. 
Targets for antimicrobial development that I'm particularly uh, optimistic about include inhibitors of lipid A biosynthesis or protein synthesis. Currently, NIAID and CDC are conducting a clinical trial to evaluate combinations of older antimicrobials previously used not, to, not used to treat gonorrhea to provide safety and efficacy data on alternative regimens for treatment of gonococcal infection. This diagram of a bacterial cell illustrates the variety of different targets for antimicrobials. The targets of some older antimicrobials are in blue. The red targets indicate some potential targets for new antimicrobials. Of these, of particular excitement are the potential for inhibitors of the efflux pump, inhibitors of membrane lipid biosynthesis, and molecular mimics of natural antimicrobial peptides. The reason for this positive outlook for these areas of investigation is that with increased attention to this emerging problem and the availability of scientific tools, we are seeing potential candidates entering into the product development pipeline. This slide illustrates the pipeline and the complexity of the product development process. It spans from basic research through product development and clinical evaluation. You start with a lot of candidate molecules, as illustrated by the balls. As you move through the, pro the development process, you narrow the candidates until hopefully you end up with one licensed product. Now, I get asked all the time, why don't more companies do this? Well, the answer is that it's a complex process. It takes a lot of time and it requires a significant amount of investment. And yes, the B in the figure stands for billion. In addition, there is a little bit of luck or serendipity. The discovery of penicillin on moldy bread is a classic example. In addition to antimicrobials, there are other products that point to new opportunities in the future. Miniaturization of devices by incorporating microfluidics or dipstick technology may transition diagnostics to use at patient point of care in non-traditional settings. An exciting potential are tests to detect antibiotic susceptibility at the time of diagnosis so that a healthcare provider can potentially utilize an older antibiotic that is still effective for the patient's infection and spare the use of new antimicrobials. Prevention strategies include the development of vaccines or microbicides. Microbicides are products being developed that women could use intravaginally to prevent infection. Challenges to the development of vaccines or microbicides are the antigenic variation of bacterial surface components, the fact that gonococci can induce antibodies that block the binding of, infective, of effective antibiotics, and finally, it is, unclear, it is unclear what immunological response is protective. Some candidates that give us hope for optimism are major outer membrane proteins, transferrin and iron binding proteins, peptide mimics of lipooligosaccharide antigens, and compounds that inhibit the attachment of the gonococci to cervical vaginal cell, uh, epithelium. However, the med biomedical and public health response is a delicate balance. It is a balance between the extraordinary capability of microbial pathogens to persist and develop resistance with the response of public health measures, biomedical research, and the development of new antimicrobials. In conclusion, the gonococci are one of many organisms with emerging antimicrobial resistance. Through biomedical research, we are increasing our understanding of the mechanism of bacterial pathogenesis. This allows us to identify prospects for new antimicrobials, vaccines, and microbicides. Though there are challenges in the time and resources required for product development, Building on our research base, I see exciting grounds for optimism in the future. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Kirkaldi from the Centers for Disease Control. 
Thank you, Carolyn. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Kirkaldi with the Division of STD Prevention at CDC. As with many public health threats facing us, the challenges as we face the response to multi-drug resistance and seek to prevent a return to the era of untreatable gonorrhea can seem challenging. However, every one of us can contribute to this response in important and meaningful ways, including public health officials at CDC, our U.S. government partners, and state and local health departments, clinicians, laboratories, and sexually active adolescents and adults. There are several things that CDC can do now and in the future. It is critically important that we continue to closely monitor trends in gonococcal resistance through GISP. We must also continue to invest in GISP, since in the U.S. it is our only source of national, regional, and site-specific gonococcal antimicrobial susceptibility data, and these data directly inform both our response and treatment recommendations. At CDC, we'll continue to update treatment guidelines for gonorrhea as needed based on the best available scientific data, both from GISP and clinical research. We'll continue to support local surveillance and laboratory capacity through formal and informal training and education and reference laboratory confirmatory testing. In the coming months, we also plan to release a national response plan that will provide guidance to local and state health departments um, in their response efforts. And this plan was developed by a multidisciplinary team in our division is currently led by Dr. Sarah Kidd. Dr. Schaefer highlighted the importance of understanding the genetic basis of resistance. My CDC colleagues in the STD branch have been conducting research on the genetic basis for decreased cephalosporin susceptibility with the hope that breakthroughs will lead to tests that will both enhance surveillance and guide treatment recommendations. But they're not alone. Other scientists throughout the country, including Dr. Schaefer and other academic and public health colleagues, have been doing this important work. We've learned today also that gonococcal resistance and the spread of resistance strains is a global problem and CDC will continue to enhance and foster international collaboration and surveillance. And we'll continue to provide data on the scientific basis for the need for culture and new antimicrobials. Our U.S. government partners, such as NIH, can continue to study the effectiveness of existing antimicrobials and combinations of antimicrobials for the treatment of gonorrhea. Dr. Deal discussed the ongoing NIH-supported clinical trials that's investigating the use of existing compounds for the treatment of gonorrhea. But studying currently, currently available antimicrobials will only take us so far. So NIH is encouraged to continue to support antimicrobial and vaccine development. And this includes research on pathogenesis and the genetic basis for resistance. And the Food and Drug Administration is encouraged to support the approval of new and safe antimicrobials, which of course are urgently needed. As Dr. Deal highlighted, we may need to study many different antimicrobial compounds before we find a few that are safe and effective. The work of local and state health departments and their STD control programs is of critical importance in our response. First, we should remember the basics of primary prevention and strengthen local gonorrhea efforts now while gonorrhea rates are at historic lows and before cephalosporin resistant gonorrhea spreads widely throughout the U.S. Health departments should enhance local surveillance for resistant gonococci. For when resistant strains do emerge in a local area, health departments will be better able to mount an effective response if they can quickly detect those strains through enhanced surveillance. Health departments can monitor local treatment patterns and ensure that persons diagnosed with gonorrhea and their partners are treated appropriately. They should also remain vigilant for locally identified treatment failures or laboratory-based resistance, respond promptly, and notify CDC. And in partnership with local public health laboratories, health departments should promote access to culture for the gonococcus and antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Our response cannot succeed without action from clinicians who are at the front lines in our fight against gonorrhea. Since many gonorrhea infections are asymptomatic, screening is an important component of gonorrhea control. We encourage clinicians to screen for gonorrhea among all sexually active women at increased risk for infection, including those under 25 years of age. In addition, clinicians should screen sexually active MSM at all exposed anatomic sites, at least annually. 
it is vital that clinicians treat patients diagnosed with gonorrhea with a cephalosporin, preferably ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams in a single intramuscular dose, and either azithromycin one gram orally or doxycycline 100 milligrams twice daily for a week. All of the patient's sexual partners from the prior two months should be evaluated and treated. And clinicians should promptly report suspected treatment failures to local or state health departments and CDC. Because not all persistent or recurrent infections may be due simply to reinfection, clinicians are urged to maintain vigilance for treatment failures. If a patient fails treatment, cultures for susceptibility should be performed. Public health laboratories must maintain or rebuild the capacity to culture for the gonococcus or partner with laboratories that can. We, as we've learned from Dr. Schaefer, culture specimens are needed for resistance testing, which is critical for the detection of novel resistance patterns, for enhancing surveillance, and for informing treatment options if a patient fails therapy. Laboratories conducting antimicrobial susceptibility testing should promptly inform the ordering clinician and local STD program of isolates that they detect with elevated cephalosporin MICs. Laboratories should store such isolates in case additional evaluation of the isolates is required. Finally, sexually active adolescents and adults can also play an important role. Protecting yourself from gonorrhea has never been more important. The most effective way to avoid getting gonorrhea is, is to abstain from sexual intercourse. Those who are sexually active can commit to safer sex to reduce their risk of becoming infected through long-term monogamy with an uninfected partner. Latex condoms, when used consistently or correctly, can reduce the risk of acquiring gonorrhea. You should promptly seek medical care for symptoms consistent with gonorrhea, such as discharge or burning with urination. But also remember that gonorrhea often does not cause any symptoms at all. If you have been diagnosed or treated for gonorrhea, you should notify all of your recent sex partners so they can see a healthcare provider as well to be tested and treated. This will protect your sex partners and reduce your risk of becoming reinfected. You should promptly notify your healthcare provider if you are treated for gonorrhea, but your symptoms do not resolve within several days. In summary, gonorrhea is a major preventable cause of infertility and can facilitate HIV transmission. Although gonorrhea rates are at historic lows, we cannot be complacent since the emergence of gonococcal multidrug resistance threatens both treatment and prevention efforts and raises the specter of a return to the era of untreatable gonorrhea. Continued surveillance for gonococcal resistance is vital to guide treatment recommendations and to target our response efforts as we try to stay one step ahead of this emerging threat. As I've outlined, there is much to do and action is needed from the public health community, clinicians, laboratories, and those at risk for infection. Right now, clinicians are urged to treat patients diagnosed with gonorrhea with ceftriaxone and either azithromycin or doxycycline. Importantly, new treatment options are urgently needed, but challenging to come by. Thank you. So um, I would like to thank our speakers who um, spent the time and effort to join us today. And I want to open the session up now for any questions or answers. So for anyone in the back, please come to the microphones, um, speak into the microphones, and keep your questions brief. OK, well, I'll um, take the moderator prerogative and get things started. So I have a question for uh, Dr. Hook. Uh, you had mentioned during your talk about the one possible approach is to have cefixime as an alternative drug um, and to use ceftriaxone. But since they're in the same class, uh, what would be the rationale for um, not using suffixine? That's a good question. Thank you, Bob. Uh, studies in the laboratory have shown that suffixine is the drug which is more able to induce evolution of resistance than gonococcine and cephalaxone. As a result, uh, the continued use of suffixine will more rapidly and more effectively fuel the development of antibiotic resistance than use of cephalaxone. Thank you. Yes. 
Uh, two questions. One, is CDC now recommending test of cure for gonorrhea treatment? And secondly, what is the level of interest in the pharmaceutical industry in either developing new drugs or at least finding new indications for old drugs to treat gonorrhea? Okay, well, I'll take a stab at the first, and perhaps I'll ask my colleagues to take the second. Um, currently, um, CDC is not recommending routine use of test of cure uh, for treatment of gonorrhea. One thing we are considering as we, can, as we think about how to upgrade our treatment recommendations in the face of this threat is if a patient is not treated uh, with ceftriaxone, but perhaps one of the other alternative agents, um, you know, perhaps that might be a situation in which tests of cure may be called for, but these are under discussion. Um, and then, um, Carolyn, do you want to handle the second? Um, so regarding the interest in developing antimicrobials for gonorrhea, that's one of the um, areas that there has been a lot of discussion with among public health agencies worldwide, how to um, spur that. Um, CDC, World Health Organization, NIH. And I think part of it is doing things like this that make a growing awareness of the problem. WHO is also uh, going to make aware of a, a global action type plan for that. But then more importantly, I think, is also some of the discussions with the, the different pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies. As you saw, there's a whole, to, to take a candidate from that whole pipeline through for a, a gonococcal indication might be challenging. But one of the ways we're hoping to do is to talk to developers who have developed antimicrobials for other indications to see would they be interested in seeing if those compounds are effective against the cur current gonococcal isolates to develop uh, increasing resistance. Because if you can take something that has t had a lot of those opportunity cost going for other indications and then get an additional indication, that becomes a potential value added. Let's take um, one question from the microphone. Yes, thank you. Chris Braden from the Division of Foodborne, Waterborne, and Environmental Diseases. Um, we who work with other bacterial pathogens have been uh, very interested in the experience with the gonococcus. Uh, because of the rapid transition from culture-based di diagnostics to non-culture-based diagnostics. And um, we're uh, all going to be faced with the, uh, uh, the challenge of, of surveillance, and especially for surveillance for phenotypic characteristics of resistance uh, in the face of non-culture diagnostics in the clin clinical laboratories. But one of the challenges even to preserving uh, the ability to do cultures is the fact that a number of the specimens that are used uh, for uh, these non-culture diagnostics are not amenable to culture. And I understand that that is true uh, for the gonococcus when they are doing the uh, nucleic acid application from urine and urine not being amenable to culture for the gonococcus. So what is the, uh, what is the uh, recommendation to overcome that type of, uh, of practice in order to uh, maintain uh, the uh, uh, flow of cultures that you would need for surveillance? I think there's, uh, thank you for the question, I think there's um, several issues that come into play. Um, I suspect that culture will not come back into routine care. The, the nucleic acid amplification tests that we have, these molecular tests, are extremely sensitive and specific and have had many advantages such as being able to move um, diagnostic testing out of the clinical setting, sometimes into outreach settings. But for those situations in which uh, perhaps a patient fails treatment or to enhance therapy, or to mean enhance surveillance, maintaining culture capacity is obviously clearly important. Um, so I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges for clinicians who want to perform culture, who, who um, think that they should and want to, is that they don't have it available. So I think one of the first steps that we've been working on is trying to bring it back into, at least even public health laboratories, many of whom have lost that capacity. Um, and also thinking about are there different types of transport media that can be used so that um, perhaps a, uh, so uh, um, they can be used to store for quite some time and then to be pulled out so it doesn't, you know, go, it doesn't expire quickly. And I think that's one of the other big challenges because perhaps a place doesn't need to do culture perhaps only once a year, you know, but all, they have all these supplies um, that expire. So those are 
I think some of the things that we uh, that we're starting with. Um, does anyone else have any other thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I think your question really, uh, uh, again, points out the importance of having uh, surveillance systems which are in place for the process. Excuse me. Uh, your question brings up the issue of having effective surveillance systems in place for monitoring gonococcal antimicrobial susceptibilities. Uh, and what we've seen again and again in separate analyses is that the trends shown through just accurately uh, reflect what's happening in our nation in terms of antibiotic resistance. So I would say that surveillance is a, a separate from diagnostic testing represents one of the great public health investments we can make to deal with this threat. Okay. Question down here. Yeah, my question was related. Chris asked part of it. Um, but uh, to build on it, how about reimbursement for a clinician who wants to order a culture, say a patient fails and, and, and wants to send it, whether to a clinical lab, I presume that some still carry, are able to do culture, I don't know. But uh, then, and how, you know, is it, who pays for it? Well, I think that's um, something that we've been having some ongoing discussions about um, because there are many places, I believe, that will only pay for one gonococcal diagnostic test. So a clinician would not get reimbursed if he sent both a NAT and a culture. So, um, you know, I think that's something else that we certainly need to discuss with, uh, with our reimbursement colleagues. In the back. Hi. Could you comment on the feasibility of conducting resistance testing using molecular or um, um, uh, uh, genetic uh, testing? Um, could, do you envision that becoming available for clinicians at some point? Um, yes, I'm, we're very optimistic about it, and it's one of the areas that um, NIAID has put um, quite a bit of effort into. There's a variety of reasons you want to do that, is if you can potentially have some type of molecular testing for that, there's in various arenas, both in the public health arena and the biodefense arena, where knowing that antibiotic susceptibility would be critical. And so this is an area that there is probably more effort uh, right now being directed towards other pathogens, but we're seeing it move into people who are trying to develop this for the gonococci also. So I, I see it in the future for sure. So I would also like to add that in collaboration with Tim Reed at Emory, we are attempting to do precisely that in sequencing genomes from many, many different strains um, to identify not only resistance genes, but also to perhaps help predict a strain that would be sensitive mm -hmm. to an antibiotic such as penicillin or tetracycline or ciprofloxacin. Um, but I would like to emphasize that you have to be able to understand all of the mechanisms of resistance and we may have only touched the surface. And as the gonococcus continually evolves and um, mutates or acquires genes, we have to be wary of alternative mechanisms of resistance that may not be seen now, but could be seen later. So just to pile on here, uh, what Dr. Schaefer's point is is, is really good. You, we can, I think, envision and, in fact, have the technologies available currently to uh, allow permissive testing in which molecular methods might be able to tell us, yes, quinolone antibiotics would be effective. But that doesn't take the place of having surveillance to detect the next mutation that this organism will come up with because uh, it continues to generate. It has multiple current mutations and we anticipate that there will be more to come. So we've, we've got two approaches. One is the issue of testing which permits us to use a specific therapy. That would be a great thing. The other is how do we keep track of what's next? Are there any questions from Envision Land? Oh. Uh, Dr. Fenton. Uh, thank you very much. Given the tremendous health inequities 
that are seen with gonorrhea in the United States. I wondered if there were special considerations as you're thinking about your control efforts for populations such as men who sex with men and African Americans in dealing with this threat, and more generally to reduce the overall burden, prevalence and incidence of gonorrhea in the country as a strategy to reduce the pressures uh, for antimicrobial resistance. Could you reflect on that, please? Sure. Uh, what we've seen with the four quinolones and now what we're seeing with the cephalosporins and indeed many of the antimicrobials that we've looked at for, through GISP is that men who have sex with men appear to be disproportionately affected by infection with resistant strains when compared with heterosexuals. So clearly this is a, a, of critical importance to that population. And um, one of the things that I think is of vital importance for that population, both from in, in surveillance and for clinicians, is to maintain heightened vigilance for those individuals. Um, make sure they're being treated appropriately. If a patient comes back with an apparent reinfection, think about whether it could be a treatment failure and also have a very fairly low threshold for perhaps doing test of cure or sort of going above and beyond what the recommendations are currently. Um, certainly enhancing surveillance for that population would be warranted. Um, one of the, um, now what we do know also is that uh, gonorrhea does disproportionately affect our African American neighbors as well, particularly in the Southeast. Um, and those are uh, populations that we really need to focus on as well. Now one of the interesting differences in terms of gonorrhea as we think of the disease uh, more largely and the issue of resistance is there is sort of a, a geographic disconnect. Um, whereas uh, gonococcal resistance does tend to emerge first in the U.S. in the West Coast and move throughout the country um, in an Eastern uh, way, often hitting the Southeast last. Um, but of course the burden of gonorrhea is highest in the Southeast. Um, so I think that um, to address the threat of gonococcal resistance, I think focusing on reducing gonorrhea on the West Coast would be warranted. But also just to just um, reduce the risk of reproductive complications and to reduce disparities, certainly reduce, um, redoubling our efforts at the local level and using the local epidemiology to guide our uh, response efforts certainly is warranted throughout the country. Anyone else? Ned, do you have any thoughts? The issue of, well, the issue of detection uh, and addressing disparities starts with detecting the infections. And particularly as we deal with the problem for men who have sex with men, we have a problem both on the side of our clinicians and our regulatory bodies. With clinicians, unfortunately, uh, people tend to screen only genital sites, forgetting uh, that there are other sites of exposure. Uh, and we now have very good data that show that when people screen individuals who have either oral or rectal sex, uh, that screening genital sites only will miss over 40 percent of the infections that are present. So detection is one. The other problem regarding detection has to do with federal approval for the use of these tests uh, at extra genital sites. And that's something that I think hats off to the CDC for leading guidance to recommend these tests and recommending that laboratories go on and take the steps to make these tests available despite the absence of FDA approval. So detection is the first step in addressing these disparities. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Bob Grucaldi and, and uh, all of our speakers for a very um, uh, engaging and enlightening session. Uh, please join us on June 19th, uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time uh, for an important session focusing on intimate partner violence. Thank you.